Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 100 of Sports Beat. Hope you're doing well. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. We got to episode 100. That's pretty fun. We got to it in two years, so that's great. We'll talk about that later. We got a special guest. I've been running through getting some people from WRSU uh, at Rutgers. I had Brett Hahn on a couple of weeks ago. I got another one here who is also with me on the Tuesday crew this spring semester. It's Amir Lighty. Amir, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate you guys having me. It's a lot of fun. So we're going to talk some NBA, some NFL, and of course, we got to talk about game five last night, the Warriors taking it, even though Steph Curry did not make a single three-point shot. Andrew Wiggins dominated, had his most points and most rebounds in a game this season, and the Celtics just could not make a shot in the fourth quarter after erasing the Warriors' lead in the third. So Amir, with Golden State up 3-2 right now, do you think they are in position to close out this series? I think so. I mean... It's always going to be hard because, you know, even with the even with the NHL playoffs, everyone it seems like at the home home advantage has been winning each game. So I'm thinking, you know, I want to I hope they do because I am not a huge Boston sports fans. I'm sorry to anyone that likes Boston sports, not a really a huge one. So I'd rather them be eliminated. But I think they're definitely going to give a good fight going on in uh, in Boston. Hopefully they get it done, but I think it's going to be seven, it's got seven game series, but I still think they're in, they're in, they're in the front seat. Yeah. I think there's a good chance the Celtics bounce back. I mean, it's rare that they lose back to back games this postseason. It happened for the first time dropping games four and five, but I think they are going to respond. The Warriors got really lucky with the fact that Draymond Green, you know, actually was somewhat productive, especially with rebounding and passing the ball. Wiggins, of course, had a huge game. Clay Thompson made five threes. Jordan Poole had another half-court buzzer beater at the end of the third quarter, second time he's done that this series. And after yeah. Steph Curry really had to carry them in game four, everybody else stepped up, and that's really shown that this Warriors team is so deep. But the Celtics do have a strong unit. They went on a stretch in that game where they hit eight straight threes, I think, in the second and third quarter. So, I mean, Tim, you know, 3-2 lead for Golden State. Where do you see this series going at this point? I agree in regards to I see this going seven games. I mean, it, it, it feels like every year in the NBA finals where it's unpredictable of what you're going to get from game to game. And Boston, again, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough that if you went in the beginning of this season, you said, wow, Boston's going to make the NBA finals. I wouldn't have believed you, but that that defense is honestly, if they can win a championship, if they don't win a championship tonight, say not, but the, the way their defensive style is, could redefine how teams approach defense, especially, and really the style of basketball in the NBA. Of course, we talk about Steph Curry, how the Warriors offense in particular really changed for, for the big haul of what we see the NBA currently. We're looking at a team that, again, could change the NBA, not back to an old style, but a, a more transitional style defense team where, again, and, and, you know, I think I was talking about this last week with you, Eddie, not during the show, but I said, hey, if you circle this for the Boston Celtics, okay, Jalen Brown, don't get me wrong, really good shooting guard, give him a lot of credit, really good at producing points and being that playmaking guy along with Jason Tatum. But let's be honest, we could probably circle six, seven, eight, maybe even ten guards in the NBA that you'd probably say, hey, that team could carry the Boston Celtics to championship. Not saying Brown isn't good. He deserves a lot of respect for that matter. But what I'm saying is in that style of offense for Boston, all they need is role players. They don't need that superstar. They need a good balanced offense. And it proves to this point that a lot of our stars in the NBA that's very electric they're known for offense. They're not known for defense. There's not a good, I mean, think about James Harden, prime example, great score, terrible defender. I mean, even everyone used to, uh, you know, uh, rag on Carmelo Anthony for years when he was great, right? Where Melo played great offense, terrible defense. Now, of course, the big men, that's a little bit different, right? You look at guys like Jokic and et cetera, where you, you're see, you have to see both sides of the game for them to be considered for an MVP, but particularly in the garden, a little bit the, uh, the the small forward position, it's a lot more offensive base. But I also want to bring up one more topic because, again, I see this going seven games. I still think Golden State can do this. But let's talk about legacy for a moment. It, and I, I guess I'll ask this question for both you guys because, to me, for, for Steph Curry in particular, we talk about him, We know he's going to be a Hall of Famer. 
We know that he is going to be arguably one of basketball's biggest influencers in NBA history since Kobe, since Jordan, LeBron, etc. But is it fair if the Golden State Warriors won a championship here this season that he can be coming to the discussion with Jordan, LeBron for the greatest of all time? Because the amount of success we've seen in the postseason for Steph Curry it's impressive. He's a winner. He's been, he's had to carry a team on his back. And of course he got help. Yeah. Jordan had help too. They had key role players around, but for legacy terms, I think it's fair to me to debate saying that Steph Curry could come into that conversation. If the golden state warriors win this championship right here. I want to, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to say, at least from my perspective, then Amir can jump in here. Like the warriors, Steph Curry, I'm not one of those people that really hates in the championships with KD as much as some others, but you still have to, you know, acknowledge the fact that Kevin Durant was on two of those championship teams and was the reason that pushed them over the edge. Kevin Durant came the year after his Thunder blew a 3-1 lead against the Warriors and the Warriors blew a 3-1 lead of their own against Cleveland. He goes to Golden State and wins two championships with them. Now, Steph Curry historically has been great in the playoffs, specifically in the NBA Finals and outside of last night, He's been, you know, he was shooting 50% from three in the first four games of this series. But I still feel like, you know, comparing him to LeBron and Jordan is a little extreme because I think both of those guys had to do more on their own to carry their teams. And Steph, this would only be his second championship without Kevin Durant. So while I think Steph Curry has changed the game, of course, three pointers and such, the game has changed because of Steph Curry. And to me, I think in some ways, I know people are critical of three point shooting, but I think there are some positive changes that Steph Curry has brought to the league. I still think it's a little extreme at this point to put him in the conversation with someone like a Michael Jordan who won six championships in eight years or LeBron James who went to 10 straight NBA finals with three different teams. I think it's just a little extreme at this point. Amir, what do you think? I mean, I, I'm going to respect Steph. I've always had, I've always had not really hatred towards him, but you know, he's annoying because he can just chuck up the ball wherever he wants and it goes in. Now we're going to always say, and I will always admit this. He's the greatest shooter of all time. You can't argue that. I, like if you want to argue that, I don't know how you're going to win because he's the greatest shooter of all time. He can score wherever he wants, whenever he wants. Yeah, he just went 0 for 10, 0 for 8 last last game, first first game without a three pointer in like 226 games or something like that, or 66 plus straight playoff games. So it's like, you know, he 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 definitely deserves his flowers. But I think I'm kind of with you, Eddie. Like, you know, if he wins this championship, he definitely put the team on his back. Clay definitely has been helping out, but he hasn't been the Clay like we see when he was with KD. And, and, you know, with that type of team, that little dynasty team. Jordan Poole, he's, he, he, he does his job, like he does his role player, but sometimes he does too much and he thinks he's like that guy. He thinks he's him. And I'm like, Jordan, you need to relax. You're not him. Like, he, yes, he, he did a couple of little buzzer beaters. Definitely helps out. Huge threes. Perfect. But, like, you know, I think when it comes to this this championship right here, I'm not even I'm going to I'm going to flip the switch a little bit. I'm not even worried about Steph cuz Steph yeah, Steph is um definitely I I actually let me answer the question first. I don't think yet he's definitely with Jordan and LeBron. He's definitely up there. He's definitely a top 10, arguably a top 5 player of all time because he definitely changed the game. Everyone wants to be Steph just instead of you know on on transitions everything instead of just trying to go to the rim and try to get a dunk or something, they just stop shoot a three somewhere and then turn around thinking it goes in and goes in. He definitely changed the game. Everyone wants to shoot threes. Every, you know, every team is now shooting more threes than usual. But I feel like he definitely needs to do more as a, as a, as a player for you to bring up, you know, LeBron and Jordan because Steph, has Steph won defensive player of the year? I don't think so. You know, has he brought, you know, the Warriors to the, to the championship, you know, four or five years straight? No. So definitely, he's definitely up there for top five, top 10 players ever. But I don't think yet we're going to Jordan and LeBron yet. But if they do win the series, 
you have to think now. I'm going to flip the switch a little bit. What does this mean for KD? Did KD, so you, does KD needed to go to Golden State to win those rings? Or will he be able to win a ring with Kyrie and the Nets or a different team if he ever gets traded or any, on another team? Because it seems like without Steph and Clay and Draymond, K- KD wouldn't have a ring yet. And that's the tough thing, too, because first of all, Amir, we all know you're an Oklahoma City Thunder fan. You're familiar with the talent that the Thunder had on those teams back in the day, and they could not break through against whether it was San Antonio or Golden State. And I mean, these Nets teams have been nothing short of a disaster over these last three years between Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving combining to play 20 games the first year, then everything that happened last season, which I think, I think last season was really their chance. You know, the, the fact that they went all the way to playing the Bucks, forced a game seven, if Kevin Durant had a smaller shoe, they would have made the conference finals. I think they would have definitely beaten the Hawks. And I think they probably would have beaten the Suns in the NBA finals. But this year, this team had a lot of holes and James Harden or Ben Simmons, no matter who you put in as the third player, that was not going to solve the only problem. You see how the Celtics, for example, the fact that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown were being covered by Goran Dragic and Seth Curry, that whole series. I mean, there's no wonder why the Nets are the only team this entire postseason to get swept. So while I still have faith in the Nets potentially, you know, turning this around the East, I think it's still very possible for them to get through. Let's not forget the Celtics were like 10th in the East halfway through this season, and they end up going all the way on a run to the NBA finals. So if the Nets could get hot late in the season and avoid injury potentially, but there's still holes in this team. I think it all starts with the coach. I don't think Steve Nash is a great NBA coach at all. I think it also hurts the assistance that the Nets lost from their staff from last year. Mike D'Antoni, who had gone in deep playoff runs. Ime Udoka was their main assistant coach the season that they were eliminated by the Bucs. Now he's coaching in the NBA finals for the Boston Celtics. So I think, but turning it back to Kevin Durant's legacy himself, I think Steph Curry, regardless of what happens in these NBA finals, at this point, Steph Curry is above Kevin Durant all time. And I, I, I don't think there's really much of an argument necessarily there. I'd put Steph Curry, I mean, I, to me, one, two, lot of people. yeah, <laughs> one, two, three, one, two, three, I've easily, you know, you can debate the order. I've got Kareem at three, and then you can debate Le- LeBron and MJ as goat one and goat two. I think Steph Curry, then you start talking about him maybe around six, seven, eight. I don't think Kevin Durant cracks the top 10 all time yet. I think Durant is probably around 12 or 13 if you're really going to rank it. And that's being generous because outside of what he did with the Warriors for two years, Kevin Durant has not been an all time playoff performer. And unfortunately, he hasn't been able to find success despite pairing up with superstars playing with different teams he's only been able to join a super team that had already won a championship and just make them unstoppable against a team that had LeBron and nobody else and basically a Western conference that had very little competition at that time so I I, Tim I want to see what you think about this but I've got to put Kevin Durant below Steph Curry right now and if Steph Curry wins this NBA finals and the Warriors win this championship obviously I think it's going to hurt Kevin Durant's legacy even more yeah, I agree. I think it's going to hurt his legacy 100%. And the big thing for me is still, and we talked about it time and time again for the Nets this year, you know, that window, it's so, so thin. Anything over these next year or two can really happen to Brooklyn in general. Because, again, not that we talk about the basketball economy so much, just like how we don't really talk about the baseball economy. But if you look at the Mets roster, there's a lot of money shelling out. It's difficult making certain moves. Let's not forget, too, you traded away so many draft picks. You know, turn around, get James Harden, got a couple back. Yeah, you have Ben Simmons. But you still don't know what's going to happen. And the problem is for me with Brooklyn, and I agree. I'll say from this standpoint, if you would have told me that the Brooklyn Nets two years ago or three years ago at this point now would have signed Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving and potentially now, of course, Steve Nash hasn't been fired yet. I agree he's not the answer, but potentially could be going through three coaches in a matter of three seasons to me would be mind blowing. That I would never have thought would have happened. Two, three years ago, I thought this team would be competing in an Eastern Conference championship at minimal every single year, even with uh, without the third player that they turned around and traded for, of course, last season, that being James Harden and now eventually Ben Simmons. Now, the big thing is this. 
I still have faith that there's still time in this window for Brooklyn. There's still faith for Kevin Durant to lead the championship to the Brooklyn Nets. The problem is you still need somebody, somebody. I don't care who it is, but you need somebody that's either not Kyrie Irving or not Ben Simmons on that team, and one of them needs to be traded away. It's just a fact that we haven't seen Ben play. I would love to see Ben Simmons play for the Nets, in my opinion. And Eddie, I think it was five episodes, six episodes ago, I proposed that they trade for Donovan Mitchell, get Kyrie Irving at least out of there, and you keep some poetic justice terms of him and Ben Simmons on the same team with Kevin Durant. And you turn around, you sign a couple complimentary forwards. I, I agree in regards to the fact that Andre Drummond, good, good statistic center, but very slow, not that good on defense. You need something more uh, translucent for the, for the Brooklyn Nets. I think that there's still a chance for Kevin Durant. It's just not going to be as easy. And the big thing is the Nets, think about this for a moment. The Nets couldn't win with a quote-unquote super team. The Nets had arguably the best roster in the NBA from a starting standpoint and couldn't win a championship still to this point because that's how much the NBA is changing, not just in terms of balance, but in terms of style and approach. And the Nets just don't have that modern style and approach fully, in my opinion, where they can never play consistent basketball on the floor after one through five. That's been my biggest criticism too for them for the last three seasons, even before they got Kevin Durant. There's not enough depth in Brooklyn. They need more depth. Depth is going to win you a championship. It obviously has helped Boston. It's helped Boston tremendously get to the NBA Finals. But for Golden State, okay, you can make the argument that, I mean, they have depth. Don't get me wrong. You can argue that their starting lineup has helped them a lot more than their depth players. But the point is, is that they could put in versatile people. I mean, think about this. A lot of they've had to do a lot of stepping up for Draymond Green this series. Draymond's had what two, three terrible games, fouls out of one, scores two points, I think, in two of them. Draymond Green was supposed to be a big center focus and supposed to be a role player for this team in this series. Now, of course. Stepped up last game a little bit, at least the, 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 the aspect of the starting lineup and, and the transition. But it's still the fact that they have role players in depth to step up in big moments. I still don't feel like the Nets have that. And when they do, they get hurt or they trade them away. And it's that simple. Yeah, I mean, it, that's the problem here. And I feel like the Nets could be, you know, First of all, you have Kyrie Irving and Ben Simmons, who are both essentially point guards on your roster. And teams with two point guards, that doesn't work. The Rockets tried it with Chris Paul and James Harden. They couldn't get deep. I know the Chris Paul injury kind of hurt them in 15, but still. Russell Westbrook and James Harden, that did not work. Kyrie Irving and James Harden, that did not work. You know, when you have two point guards on a team, especially when Ben Simmons is a liability when shooting the ball, and also we still don't know when or if he's even going to play, I mean, you're kind of in a stuck situation. Obviously, I don't think Kevin Durant wants Kyrie Irving gone. Kevin Durant has defended Irving throughout all of this, but there are still moves that can be made. And I feel like you need another wing scorer on this team that's like, you know, Seth Curry is great and all, but someone who can actually be, you know, potentially all-star caliber as a shooting guard. And there's so many that are potentially on the move this offseason between Donovan Mitchell, Zach Levine, you know, Buddy Heald is always rumored, Bradley Beal. There's a lot of people out there that the Nets could maybe trade for, but you could also just try to bolster your bench even more so you have depth. We saw the Nets playing with just a complete, you know, hollow lineup for a good part of the season when there were injuries or when they had the COVID issue in January and you had players that were, you know, on two-way contracts and from the G League in the starting lineup. And Kevin Durant is a year older. Kyrie Irving's a year older. They're going to have their aches and pains. They're going to miss games. You know, Kevin Durant, let's not forget, he tore his Achilles only two and three years ago. So, I mean, there's still a lot of things that the Nets can do. The window isn't closed, but, I mean, it's it's not – it hasn't gotten any better over the last year or two. But – Let's talk about the other team that kind of disappointed this year. That's the Los Angeles Lakers. And I saw Stephen A. Smith said today that healthy Anthony Davis, he'd take over both Luka Doncic and Nikola Jokic, which I think is absurd. 
That that's 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 crazy. And then the whole thing, the rumor that Anthony Davis, when he said that he hasn't picked up a basketball since April 5th or whatever, I don't even know why he's saying that. I mean, the Lakers made their hire. They brought Darvin Hammond, who's been a great assistant for the Bucs over the last few years, also spent a lot of time playing in the NBA uh, back in the 2000s. So Amir at this point with a Western conference that is very deep with young teams, older teams, and then you've got the Lakers. What do you see as the direction this summer for LA? Because I, clearly I don't think Westbrook's going anywhere. It's going to be LeBron, AD, and Westbrook, and then whoever else they can piece together. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, I knew Westbrook wasn't going anywhere. And, you know, I'm a Westbrook fan. Obviously, I was a Thunder fan, so I'm going to support Westbrook. I think it was one bad season. If he has another bad season, then obviously you got to talk about, okay, he might be on the decline. It's time for him to go and everything, or maybe even the trade trade deadline. But it's time to clear out a little bit. AD, I don't know why I saw, I literally saw the video. It was a TikTok where he said it. He was literally cooking, like, crawfish and seafood and everything and talking about how he didn't shoot a ball until April 5th. I don't know why he would say that because that just looks bad on him. It seems like he doesn't care. He, you know, he's, we see him on social media hanging out with some phase players going to Las Vegas and everything, you know, it just seems like he's just living a life instead of really rehabbing and getting back to where he wants to be. But I think it's time to clear house a little bit and try to, you know, get a better bench. It's time for the, they have the star players just like the Nets. They just need a better bench. They need, you know, you have a couple people and just off of my mind, you know, it's time that, you know, let's pick up Duncan Robinson. You can probably afford a salary. Duncan Robinson is still a great shooter. He's not being used as much as Miami anymore. Pick up a Duncan Robinson. Pick up a Jalen Brunson. He's definitely going to get a payday this offseason now after his playoff performance. You know, these are the type of role players that will help your team. Look at, you know, like going back, going to go, look at Golden State. Look at Poole. You know, he was in the G League for a little bit. Look at Looney. Look at Gary Payton. Like, those are players that have been not been solidified in the NBA yet, but they're still working hard and they've been playing hard and they're, they're going to, they're going to help that team as much as possible, as much as they can. So it's time for LeBron and the GM and everything. I want to clear out just maybe a couple people like THT can go, Dorian can go, he can go, you know, we can probably talk about, uh, you know, you can probably get a nice trade value with Malik Monk. He didn't have a terrible season. Malik Monk can come there, you know, get him traded, maybe trade him for maybe a couple draft picks or something, you know, maybe even draft a player this year, you know, see who your death is, you know, and the Lakers, you know, hopefully this year with the coach, with the new coach, with new, you know, medical team too, they fire their medical, their medical, their head medical doctor, you know, with all the injuries, you know, new medical team coming in, maybe getting the the guys back onto a nice little, uh, you know, diet and you know keeping their bodies right and keeping them healthy and you know I hopefully that will help them this year but they need to start making moves and not just adding everyone that's 34 35 like a mellow like a drum in like a, a Dwight Howard like those you need you're gonna start needing depth you need youth it's time for the youth to show why they can help you know the old heads out just like Jordan Poole Pay- Looney you know, uh, they're helping Steph and Clay out. You know, they're helping Draymond out. They they're the experienced ones, and that's how the the experienced players will help the young young players and show them what needs to be done. And it's a great combination. Yeah, but the th- concerns I still have is Anthony Davis's health. Of course, he's missed so much time each of these last you know two seasons. I mean, LeBron is a year older. LeBron still had an incredible season, but. And will Russell Westbrook be able to adjust in year two to a bigger role? Because clearly he didn't really know what his role was going to be because LeBron essentially plays the point a lot. And Russell Westbrook is a point guard himself and was trying to become a scoring wing player. And we know when he shoots the ball repeatedly off the top of the backboard, that's not going to work. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the Lakers. Western conference is going to be very interesting next year, but the finals going to want to pay attention to them three, two right now. I think game six is Thursday warriors try to close it out. Celtics try to force a game seven. I want to shift gears a little bit to the NFL because um, as I said, me and Amir, we're both on the WRSU crew. And one of our signature debates that happened there with Alex and everyone else was about Carson Wentz versus Lamar Jackson as quarterbacks. And Amir is a big defender of Carson Wentz and you know as someone who's an Eagles fan and has experienced the Carson Wentz era and wanted Carson Wentz gone and wanted them to keep Nick Foles after they won the Super Bowl back in 2017 we clearly see differently about this but 
Wentz is going to Washington in an NFC that is kind of open outside from, of course, Tampa Bay and L.A. There's a lot of bad teams in the NFC this year. And I mean, the commanders, if their defense can stay healthy, if Terry McLaurin gets his payday, you know, you've got weapons, you've got a situation that Wentz could potentially thrive in. So, Amir, what are you expecting from Carson Wentz this year? And do you still back your uh, argument that he's better than Lamar? I I, I see, Steve, look, you're trying to change my words. I never said Wentz is better than Lamar. I said Wentz as a quarterback, throwing accuracy, passing, that's where he's a better overall player. Obviously, Lamar Jackson is amazing. He's uh, amazing. The way he can run, he can get out the pocket, he can see the vision, he can see down the field, but he's still inaccurate at times. Obviously, it didn't help Hollywood dropping open passes this year and, you know, and he had Mark Andrews that really stayed him a little bit, but as a quarterback in an overall quarterback with throwing and passing accuracy, I'll pick Wentz over Lamar Jackson, but what Wentz needs to do this year, he needs to make the playoffs. He has to make the playoffs. That is the main goal for him to make the play is the, is to make the playoffs and show why he still, he can still have that 2017 quarterback in him. I didn't think, I honestly didn't think he had a bad season with the Colts. I thought the Colts season wasn't terrible. Obviously, yes, you got to be a, 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 a two in like 15 Jaguars or uh, wherever they finish. I think it was two and 15 to win a game, to win the go into the playoffs. But uh, for some reason, the Colts hasn't been the Jaguars in Jacksonville since 2014. So a big thing that needs to be done this year is Wentz needs to definitely make the playoffs. He needs to learn how to not be uh, Mr. Fix-It. Like, he has to be – he has to do everything. Like, putting balls in very dangerous places, you know, chucking stuff up. Like, just thinking, like, he needs to calm down with thinking, you know, don't try to be Superman. Don't be be super at all. Like, he needs to show that he was – like, he was in 2017 where he made the accurate passes. He knew where to go. He knew what plays to be done. He knew how to get out the pocket better. Obviously, the ACL doesn't help him. But if we, if the Carson Wentz wants to be known as still a great quarterback or good quarterback, because we all saw what he did in 2017, even 2018 before when he was hurt, he brought the, he brought a team with no wide receivers. Everyone was hurt to a playoff game. And like, I feel like that is not talked about enough because he did do very well that year. But if he wants to be considered still a top 15 quarterback, he needs to make playoffs. He needs to cut down on interceptions and his QBR needs to be not excellent, but better than last year's. So Tim, my question for you, I mean, NFC East Cowboys did lose Amari Cooper, some changes on their roster. Eagles made it to the playoffs last year. They added AJ Brown, the giants are the giants. And then you have Washington. So right now looking at this NFC East, you know, we're about two months away from the preseason starting which team do you think is the best and which ones do you think could make it to the postseason? Yeah, yeah I've got the Giants going 17 and 0. There's no <laughs> doubt. Um, no, oh, I, I, you that. know, I, I, I'll first, I'll start with this. Okay. And I, I guess I'll tap in on the Carson Wentz situation a little bit. I, I'm going to be honest. I think Carson Wentz is one of the most overhyped quarterback in NFL history. I'm, I'm, I don't care what he did for Philadelphia. Carson Wentz is reckless. That has been the biggest criticism of Carson Wentz. I thought him going to Indianapolis was a great opportunity to turn around his career. Indianapolis took an opportunity to turn around, and yes, they were in a playoff position, but they were not in a playoff position because of Carson Wentz's ability. Because that defense is still solid and always underrated season after season. They have a great offensive line, and it's going to be disappointing this year, in my opinion, when Matt Ryan turns around, throws for 30-plus touchdowns, puts on the consistent stats thrown for around 5,000 yards that he typically does that people don't realize. And I'm not saying he's going to carry the Colts to a Super Bowl. I'm not saying he's going to carry them to a big run. But at least bring the Indianapolis Colts the somewhat relevancy of making the playoffs. And to, to, I guess, tap in at least a little bit of comparison to Lamar Jackson, Lamar Jackson, yeah, may not exactly have the best of accuracy as a quarterback. Don't get me wrong. He went through his struggles, ultimately deserved an MVP. But you're comparing a mobile quarterback to somebody that is essentially a field general. I guess you could say an improviser until he tore his ACL. But 
Lamar Jackson, in it, and this is this is the difference with Lamar Jackson. Okay, if Lamar Jackson has an arm injury like Cam Newton, Lamar Jackson becomes Cam Newton. That's a realism. That's a fact of it. If he has a leg injury, he becomes Robert Griffin III. Lamar Jackson has to protect his own body, has to protect his own his own value. That that's what makes being Lamar Jackson so difficult in the NFL. Mobile quarterbacks don't last long. Michael Vick, great start to his career. End of year, uh, end of career, Michael Vick wasn't so great. Injuries catch up with you. I, taking hits catch up with you. And it's not saying that Lamar Jackson is going to have that happen. He's once in a generation talent. But comparing him to Carson Wentz, where had an injury early in his career, hasn't really been the same. Yes, you carried it in Philadelphia to another playoff. And you were a big part of what that Super Bowl run was, even though Nick Foles was the answer in the playoffs. It's the fact that, again, I look at that team, great defense. And in the NFC East this year, there is a lot of this, a lot of this. I'm not saying that he can't carry the commanders, but the commanders are falling apart. If they don't do something this year, McLaurin's going to leave. Because if I'm not mistaken, he's a free agent. Mm-hmm. He wants out more than ever, to my understanding, too. But McLaurin's going to leave. You have a solid pass rushing defense, especially. But the problem is in Washington, there's so much age. There's not a balance in, in their defense still. And that's been a problem for the last three seasons. They have a great defensive line, younger pass rush, but everything else is a little bit underwhelming. They can play complementary football, but not to an elite level like your Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which of course have Tom Brady, but it's the fact of they could play complementary football on both sides. The same thing with the Rams. You know, the, the Rams defense, don't get me wrong, Matthew Stafford played great in the Super Bowl, but that defense and a big play by Aaron Donald is what won them a Super Bowl late in that game. I, I just don't feel that way for Washington. I say I still feel every season, Eddie, that that team, and I know I'm a Giants fan, and this could be a Giants bias, but I still feel even the Giants. Now, the offense is terrible last year, don't get me wrong, but they're still better of a team than Washington. I think Washington is the worst team in the NFC East. And me, not liking the Eagles, I still feel the Eagles are a better team than Washington. And the Eagles, again, a lot of opportunity this year. You make some big trades. You have a lot of opportunity. And I'll put it like this, too, for the Philadelphia Eagles. There's a lot on the line. If you don't play good this year, if you're Jalen Hurts, if you don't see improvement in passing. Uh, he has to go. This, 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 this is going to be his last year's starter in Philadelphia. It's just a fact. He needs to perform. Same thing with the Giants with Daniel Jones. There's a lot of if factors. And unfortunately, the realism is, one of these quarterbacks, their starting careers are probably over after this season. Rather, if it's Carson Wentz, Daniel Jones, probably Daniel Jones, let's be honest. But it's the fact that Daniel Jones, Carson Wentz, Jalen Hurts, one of them's going to go. The only one that's guaranteed a starter throughout the rest of his career in Dallas is Dak Prescott. And that's just a fact. This is Dallas's division to lose. I know they've lost players, but their offense w- with Kellen Moore is still one of the most unique offenses in the NFL. I, I really want to see Kellen Moore as a head coach. Now, I'm glad that the, the Giants turned around, you know, got Joe Shane, got Dable, and tur- turned around and is seeing a positive momentum transition. But for me, I would have loved to see Kellen Moore as the New York Giants coach because of how innovative he is. And I don't care that the Cowboys ran out the clock in their playoff game. That one play doesn't justify how good they played throughout a season. And I don't think Dallas regresses even losing Amari Cooper with the fact that this offense could still play to an elite level. The only factor I would say for the Dallas Cowboys for me that is concerning, if Ezekiel Elliott cannot get to what he once was again, they're in a lot of trouble. Zeke's had a bad two years. First with the fumbling two seasons ago. Now he he has Trent Richardson-like numbers in regards to yards per carry, it feels like, and a lack of vision this season. And I know him and Dak have a great relationship. They're practically best friends, which could play a little bit of a sway of keeping him on that roster throughout his career. But 
if you're not getting production from Zeke early, unfortunately, the realism is, is that they're going to need a lot more focus in that running back depth because Dak Prescott as well, for the record, has not um, been exactly the healthiest the last two seasons either. So you're going to want to see at least a little bit of assistance on that side. Yeah, like for me, I still like the Cowboys as the favorites, but I think the Eagles are close and I think they've made big improvements. The defensive line, drafting Jordan Davis, obviously A.J. Brown is another weapon. But I mean, as much as I was hating on Carson Wentz a few minutes ago, they're not the Giants. I know Washington Stadium is literally falling apart, but you know, the the, the Giants... I mean, we're running quarterback sneaks on third down and nine last year. I know you're not you're not going to have Jake Fromm as your quarterback. You have Daniel Jones and Tyrod is a very suitable backup. But I still like Washington with their coaching staff and with their unit, specifically their defense, slightly above the Giants, though. I think the Giants will improve this year. Uh, just a couple minutes left. I just want to ask you quickly, Amir. I know you're a big NHL fan, especially in the postseason. You like those playoffs more than the NBA, which is true. They're more exciting. Finals, Stanley Cup final starts on Wednesday between Tampa Bay and Colorado. Who do you have getting the edge there? Listen, real quick, because I see it. Yep. First of all, shout out to the Lightning defeating the Rangers. Had to. I'm sorry if you guys are Rangers fans, but I just can't stand the Rangers. What a great series comeback. But I got the Colorado Avalanche. I told it, I said it since the start, since September, that they're going to win this year. I even have a bet of a future on them that they were going to win this year. So I'm thinking Colorado, I think we're going to, they're going to get them in six. Hopefully, hopefully maybe even seven, but that's going to be an amazing series between, you know, a team that's going to go for a three P to a team that, you know, should have been in the finals probably even a year or two years before. So, you know, with Nathan McKinnon playing outstanding right now, Edwin McCarr, you know, uh, they just, the, whatever they, what the Colorado needs is their starting goalkeeper back. I think that he might be back, but if he's not back, that might be the really only thing that's really hurt hurting for the avalanche because Vasilevsky looks like he's back to himself. So that's going to be obviously great series. I can't wait for that to start, but I have Colorado in six, maybe even seven, but you know, that's, I can't wait for that to start. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Colorado's offense is so dynamic, putting up eight against Mike Smith and the Oilers, uh, I think in game one, that eight, six game, but uh, that'll be it for this Amir Lighty. Thanks so much for joining us here on sports Bay. Thank you guys. Appreciate you guys having me. Well, thank you to Amir Lighty for joining us on episode 100. Eddie Kalegi and Tim Moore back here. And uh, two quick things. Want to talk a little NASCAR and then, of course, celebrate the fact that we're at 100 episodes. Uh, first, shout out Daniel Suarez getting the win at Sonoma Raceway. That was a fun race. I'm a big Chris Buescher fan. Loved seeing him in the mix. You know, Harvick, Brad Keselowski had a couple of their best days of the season. So really a topsy-turvy race. We saw Kyle Larson try to use that same fuel strategy he used last year with staying out on the stages and ended up not helping him. Chase Elliott's pit crew and some other things just were a disaster for him. And in the end, we saw some underdogs up there and Suarez, who I think between he and Tyler Reddick were the two most talented drivers in the Cup Series who were still looking for their first career win. And, you know, what a career arc for Daniel Suarez just two years ago, DNQing from the Daytona 500 with Gaunt Brothers Racing. And just two years later now, going to be heading to the NASCAR playoffs, driving for Trackhouse Racing, which is a team that has three wins this season, tied with Joe Gibbs Racing for the second most for any organization so far this season. So big time shout out to that team and Daniel Suarez. And uh, now that Fox is done with their coverage, it's a week off and NBC takes over, you know, it's sort of you kind of think of this as the halfway point of the season, even though it's not technically, but it really is the halfway point in the season. At this point, Tim, um, looking at the second half, what are some expectations that you have moving forwards, especially these last 10 races of the regular season with some big names like Ryan Blaney, Martin Truex Jr., Tyler Reddick, still unsure if they're going to be making the playoffs or not, want to win a race, but you've got some road courses, some other wild card tracks over this summer stretch. Well, first I'll start off with this because the pace of last race, in my opinion, Eddie, um, really now is starting to give us a little bit of a clear picture of what we should see at least throughout a little bit more of the regular season in regards to a couple more races we're going to see. Uh, of course, obviously, we got to see Coda and, and now Sonoma as our first two road courses. And I'm not going to lie. 
I enjoyed the race. I enjoy the older form of Sonoma. I shouldn't say it's the oldest, but the older form of Sonoma that they've gone back to before the carousel version. And I genuinely like it a lot. Now, I do want to say this. I, I do have one concerning factor, um, not to be a, a Debbie Downer on it, but these next gen cars have so much grip with their body style, the independent suspension and so on in regards to how it's changed. Um, the one thing I don't like, and I really just don't like is the fact that there's only passing opportunities in the incredibly slow corners. And I'm talking about the highest slow speed transitions. Think about it in Dakota. Where were you making passes? It was it, it was basically in the 90 degree turns or where you had to come to a dead stop or you're coming in the horseshoes. Same thing at Sonoma. It was turn 11, turn six or turn five, whatever you want to call it, depends on which course you're comparing it to. But needless to say, when you're going down to second or first year, uh, you know, is your only time to make passes, which to me is a little bit concerning because in at least the older NASCARs, and I'm not trying to be old, the old NASCARs were better, you know, back in the Gen 4 days, but there was opportunities in turns four. You know, coming up the hill, it was very difficult in turns two and three to make passes. We used to see passes made there all the time, even though it's narrow. Um, and, and yeah, again, a lot of it has to do with the cars having a little bit more grip, carrying a lot more speed. They're not downshifting coming up that hill anymore. They're still in third gear. But the fact of the matter is, is that that to me is a little bit concerning because that sets the tone for the rest of our road course races this year. Because guess what that means for the Roval? That means that really at the Roval, your only big passing opportunities are going to be in the infield on those two hard right hand corners. And really, I would say the, 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 the two little uh, chicanes they have. That that's really going to be your only passing opportunities at the Roval. Road America, I'm scared to actually see Road America. Road America, because let's be honest, outside of uh, the 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 backstretch left hander, or I should say the 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 Moraine sweep left hander and the backstretch right hander to come back up the hill to lead you up for to eventually to start finish line. There's not many slow zones there. There's only two, very reminiscent to what I guess you could say Sonoma could be, but a longer racetrack. So that's a little bit concerning because, again, I don't see many passing opportunities. And I think we learned a little bit more as a result of that. But, hey, we're going to see a couple tracks too. New Hampshire, really good track for Kevin Harvick, I think, to get into the mix of being a winner. I still think Tyler Reddick is going to win a race in this regular season. I just think there's no way he can't. Two races he should have already won, both Auto Club and Bristol Dirt, and it just didn't turn out to be that way. And it's crazy to think, we have 10 races left in the regular season. If four of those races we have new winners, we're at 16. If we see five new winners in half of them, the win in your midterm goes out. And I, I, thank God it goes out the window because I can't stand it. I can't stand it. But realistically, too, even if we just have four more winners, Eddie, what does it matter? Because the 16th position doesn't account for a winner. If really, if 15 guys win, they're in. If that 16th guy wins, it's not guaranteed if he's not the highest in points. So theoretically, and I say it like this, Ryan Blaney, he continue his run, be top three, top four in points, let's say, not win a race, he could still be your 16th guy in the playoffs based upon the rules. That's the fact of it. You know, he's not in the best of positions, but he's in position, if that makes sense, that if he stays above guys that have a win. And we're seeing, by the way, a lot of guys outside the top 20 now winning races. Danny Hamlin, of course, he's locked in. He has two wins. Uh, Austin Sindrick outside, Daniel Suarez, Kurt Busch. They're all outside the top 16 in points. So it, while it's good for them, they lock themselves in. You don't want to see new winners. And for the record, I think we're going to see some more repeat winners. I do think in, we'll see at least two or three more repeat winners. But when it's all said and done, I shouldn't say two or three, probably about four. But I would not be surprised if we see four or five new winners. And I really hope we do. Because it's going to be so good for the sport. And the big thing, it's going to make the playoffs balanced. When's the last time in this playoff system we didn't see someone come in with a big advantage? Really, I'd say it was the first, the, the first new play, uh, the first run of the new playoff system where they didn't really have 
those big bonus point spreads. That's the only time I can recall. And it, it turned out to be a pretty solid end in a run to a championship uh, for, for a lot of these guys. You know, it was a good playoff story. A lot of the playoff races had meaning. Not that these playoff races won't have meaning, but the fact that there's a lack of spread of bonus points and a lot of opportunity, it's going to make it interesting. And I, I think the end of this regular season, it's going to be a tense. We essentially have two more plate races, both Atlanta and Tal, or excuse me, Daytona not Talladega, you know, still left in the mix as well. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And NASCAR in the summertime, it's going to be fun. I'm eager to see too about Pocono. How is Pocono? This could be a defining race for Pocono. You know, N- NASCAR last year really missed it with that package. There's, there's a lot of opportunity at that track to really get antsy with shifting. Shifting's always been a discussion, but you may have to talk about double shifting in turn one, for example, utilizing things and left rear tires. We, we didn't have it last week because it's a road course, but my God, I'm confident someone will cut down a left rear tire at Pocono. So it, it's going to be a fun, fun rest of this regular season. And I hope, I hope it continues to stay balanced because this could be one of the best NASCAR playoff series to be because I can't even circle a driver as of the moment that I can say, wow, you're getting out in the round of 16. Because really, every driver shows up at different points throughout the season. And the predicted balance that we expected to have at this point of where teams are going to start figuring it out and you're going to start seeing constant repetitive winners, we're not seeing that really. And don't get me wrong. You know, uh, the, the, the one in 99 have found a lot of speed. But at the end of the day, they, they still, they've only won three races. That's, that's you know, that's, that, that's not everything yet. So I'm eager to see what happens. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people thought, for example, Kyle Larson was going to go on like some Jimmy Johnson career arc and go on like some crazy run. He hasn't been that dominant. This past week was only a second stage win of the entire season. And, you know, when you look even just at the general points, avoiding the wins, the actual points, the fact that Chase Elliott and Kyle Busch are up there first and third, you would not think that those are two of the most consistent drivers this season. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even really realize it because it's been so balanced and, you know, JGR has started to figure things out. Kyle Busch has been solid this year. Ever since about the beginning of May, Denny Hamlin has been one of the more consistent drivers in the series. Uh, I still have faith that Truex may turn things around and get to victory lane at some point before the regular season comes to an end, especially with some road courses on the way and Pocono, which is a solid track for him. But, you know, Truex, Blaney, I think, is bound to get a win before the regular season comes to a close. I have a feeling Kevin Harvick, we're starting to see Harvick building together some solid runs. These older guys, it's taken them a while to adjust to the next gen car. Denny Hamlin struggled at the beginning. He's starting to figure it out. Kyle Busch had a rough first couple races. He's figured it out. Kurt Busch, he got that win at Kansas. He's been running better, you know, and I think Truex and Harvick are due and I think they're going to start to shake things out. And of course, you expect Tyler Reddick. He's had so many chances to eventually be able to break through and get a win. He's been the favorite in multiple races before. It just hasn't been able to close it out. I think RCR is going to get a win before the regular season is over, whether it's Reddick or Austin Dillon. There's always like one random race every year that Austin Dillon does really good in. Same goes with Chris Buescher. Unfortunately, I kind of feel like Sonoma was Chris Buescher's opportunity to get to victory lane. But you never know with Busher, he'll surprise you like that random race at Homestead last year where all of a sudden he was the fastest car on the track and won a stage until stage three at a bad pit stop. So you never know, but there's a long way to go in the regular season. And like you said, two plate tracks. You've got Daytona. You've got Atlanta, which is essentially a plate track this po- at this point. You have Bubba Wallace and Ricky Stenhouse Jr., who have both had bad seasons, are two of the best plate drivers and two of the most aggressive drivers in the Cup Series that are trying to make up for the fact that they're outside the top 25 in points right now. So those are two people. And Justin Haley as well, someone who's, you know, has a Cup win at a plate track back in 2019 with Spire. You know, there's there's so many ways that this can go over these next 10 races. And really, three road courses still in this regular season, plus the two pit plate tracks. You can argue five of these last 10 races are really wild cards because, as we saw at Sonoma and Coda, the guys that were contending at the end weren't the ones you'd necessarily expect up there. At Coda, Alex Bowman being in the mix at the very end. At Sonoma, of course, Suarez, Bush, or Harvick being your top three for a good part of their late run. Michael McDowell running in the top five, you know. There's a lot of surprises and there's still a lot of spots up for grabs. So 
going to be very curious to see how this all settles out over this summer stretch on NBC. And I was just going to say this too. I just want to point out two more drivers that he can't get out. I mean, what a, what a showcasing moment, you know, the, at Sonoma for Michael McDowell. I mean, let's be honest. I'm not saying that Michael McDowell, I mean, of course we know he can win a plate race, but that honestly was a little bit promise for, for me to see for them in a road course department, because they really have talked about all year long where they feel like that's, if it's not a play track, their best chance to win a race. And they played a right strategy. They were up there. McDowell, especially early on in that race, had a lot of speed. And while he didn't fade as bad in the long run, you know, the right opportunity and also I want to point out this for Chris Busher. Chris Busher in very, very minuscule opportunities. I was talking about this late last night. This is one of maybe two or three instances I can remember in the last 15 years where somebody got a penalty and NASCAR actually overturned it, you know, where, where, where they, they initially give the penalty, they sat back, whatever, and allowed him to keep his position and then turn around and overturn it in a stage break transition. I uh, get a fuel can penalty, of course, and the only near moment I can think of is Chase Elliott, which ultimately Martinsville set him up for that championship run. Remember when he had the penalty for the man over the wall too soon, turned around the pit crew, uh, the pit, uh, the pit crew member, I believe it was a Jack man. The member was Jack man or tire change, but either way, reestablished himself and they turned out it wasn't a false start um but i don't want to count out mikey i think he could still win a race um eric jones again i I can't emphasize enough how surprising that team has been and there's a lot of good tracks for eric jones coming up too i know we've covered the fact that you know he's been a solid play track driver really good at tracks like darlington and these intermediates i'm not saying he's the best in new hampshire but there's a couple tracks where I could see him really getting the mix in the late going. So I'm eager to see what he can. And again, I don't want to undermine this either. Brad Keselowski has quietly been starting to get better. And I know he can't make it on points. He needs a win. But I cannot imagine a season. I don't care if it's Roush or ever, where Brad Keselowski wins a dual race at a plate track and then doesn't win throughout the season. I think RFK is going to get a victory, but I think it's going to be Brad Keselowski, and I think it's going to come in the late portions of the season. And let me wrap up the discussion with this. The next-gen car, while it might have its flaws at the short tracks, while the tires might still be of concern and some of the other car failures, when is the last time you can think of that there are 25 drivers you can realistically say have a chance week in and week out to win a Cup Series race? I mean, you know, you think back to the early 2000s, that's really the last time you can compare to where you had this many guys on a weekly basis that have a legitimate chance to contend for a victory. And that's what we're seeing regardless of the racetrack. And there's always a new surprise. There's always somebody up there you don't expect. Austin Dillon being in the top five and contending at Martinsville, looking like the second best car. Who saw that coming? I know Martinsville was a terrible race, but Austin Dillon was one of the fastest cars there. Daniel Suarez was not a great road course driver in the past. All of a sudden this season runs well at Coda, gets the win at Sonoma. Chris Buescher finishing second at Sonoma. I mean, just the surprises are endless. Eric Jones having chances this year. Suarez also back at Auto Club, nearly beating Kyle Larson in that race. So, you know, there's a lot of different things to consider here. And I'm really excited for what these next 10 weeks have to hold. But we also have to celebrate here on Sportspeak because tomorrow is the two-year anniversary of episode one. And now we are at episode 100, 100 episodes of Sportspeak. Obviously, a shout out to Raheel and Zoe as well, who have been our regular contributors and fill-ins when me and Tim can't be here. We've had a slew of guests over these last 100 episodes and excited for what's to come over the next 100. I'm glad we're able to continue this. Obviously, me and Tim started this podcast two years ago during COVID, where there wasn't much going on in the sports world, and we wanted something to do. And we've been able to continue it even through these last, you know, two years and into now with the world getting back to normal. And it's been great that we've still been able to keep this podcast going. So, Tim, you know, it's been a fun first 100 episodes. I'm excited for what's to come. Yeah, I'm excited definitely for what's to come. I mean, again, the fact that I think about two years ago, the fact that we were able to start this and we had discussions about doing a couple of things at uh, at the TV studio, uh, you know, uh, for doing shows but that never turned out to be. But the fact that we were able to put something together and I, I had a lot of fun with this, you know, do, doing stuff with broadcasting, of course, with you. And we, we, I, I love to go on, on, on Raheel's podcast sometimes as well, you know, just talking Yankees, you know, whatever. Raheel's great. Same thing with Zoe, you know, bright future for both of them in this broadcast the industry along with you and I, i'm just 
I'm just so happy, you know, to have a, you know, a good group around that's just enjoyable, relaxed. And listen, we have great debates all the time about certain things. Yeah, you know, there's some dull moments, there's some great moments, but at the end of the day, we're all family, we're all joyful. And I'm just so thankful the fact that we're able to, you know, as a group, able to, to, to really put together, you know, some fun content week in, week out. I know there's some lapses sometimes where, hey, life goes on. That's life. Guess what? You know, but at the end of the day, you know, we've had a lot of fun moments. And uh, by the way, I don't know if we're going to go into fun moments, but I still would argue, I think my favorite moment now of all time, if you asked me last year, it was probably, oh goodness, I, I would say last year, before episode 50 would have probably been our good debate about the Yankees when I went on the rant, especially yeah. during the pandemic. I, I think it's the Tim Tebow debate. I don't think anything beats the Tim Tebow debate, in my opinion. I think that's one of the best moments on sports speak of all time where I don't think there was a single person not picked off in the room and every person was going at it for a good 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, that's that's a classic one. I also enjoyed more recently this year when uh, we've broken some news on Sportspeak, for example, when I had you and Raheel on and we found out that Juju was going to the Chiefs or when I had Zoe on and at that exact time we found out Max Scherzer was Max injured. Scherzer. 30, yeah, 30 seconds after you said that Max Scherzer never gets hurt, all of a sudden he had like a, a hamstring pull. Yeah, that, that, that was a classic as well. I also remember we had a good debate about Kyle Busch when, when, uh, about where he ranks all time amongst NASCAR drivers. But we've got a lot more fun content to come this summer. I've got a couple exciting guests lined up, so stay tuned for that. And, you know, next show we'll probably get some more baseball. We'll have reaction to the NBA Finals, which will be wrapping up this week. But we'll talk about some baseball because, of course, Yankees and the Mets are currently the two best teams in the major leagues. Yankees number one, Mets number two right now record-wise. So stay tuned for that on episode 101. Of course, also our NASCAR weekly pick em. You can follow along on Twitter at Sportspeak Live. We got a week off from that because NASCAR is off. We'll be back with that next Sunday because NASCAR goes racing at Nashville to begin the second half of their season. And all episodes available on both YouTube and Spotify. Subscribe on YouTube. Go to Spotify. Search Sportspeak. Add it to your playlist. Add it to your favorite podcast. You can do all of that. But that's going to be it for episode 100. We hope you enjoyed. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. Signing off until next time here on Sportspeak.